A Japanese community was plunged into darkness after a 21-year-old man named Mutsu Tui cut the electricity line to the village. Using flashlights strapped to his head, he moved through the dark, eerily mimicking a cultural practice known as yobai, or night crawling. Within a span of about an hour and a half, almost half of the small community's population was either killed or gravely injured. This horrific event unfolded on the night of May 21st, 1938, in the quiet rural village of Kamo, close to Tsuyama in Okayama Prefecture, then part of the Empire of Japan. Today we delve into one of the darkest chapters in Japanese history, the Tsuyama Massacre. Our story begins with the birth of a baby boy, Mutsuo Tui, on March 5, 1917, in Okayama Prefecture. It is assumed that he was born in the area of the Chugoku Mountains, on the northern side of Okayama, during the early days of the Taisho era, when Japan was gradually becoming more industrialized. Little is known about Mutsuo's parents, except that they were relatively well off during this era. Mutsu was their second child and only son, and he had an older sister. Tragically, Mutsu's happy childhood was cut short when he lost his parents to tuberculosis while he was still an infant. In the early 1900s, tuberculosis was the second leading cause of death, and little was known about how to cure it. After the loss of his parents, Mutsu and his sister were placed in the care of their grandmother, initially at a temple and later at her residence in Kaiyo. Kaiyo was a picturesque village set against a backdrop of mountains that extended from east to west. Most residents were engaged in agriculture and farming, celebrated harvests with festivals, and occasionally hunted boars. Though somewhat isolated and insular, the village was not entirely cut off from the outside world, thanks to the presence of a telephone pole. Returning to Mutsu, he became the head of his household, even though he had an older sister, a position not traditionally given to daughters in Japan. Life with his grandmother was stable, as she had some land and an income from dry farming. Mutsu occasionally helped her with farming chores. Education was also important in this isolated village. Mutsu attended Nishikamo Elementary School, where he was known as an excellent and gifted student. Despite a lack of written records on his personality, he was well liked by his peers. Truly, Mutsu seemed to be every parent's dream child. However, life wasn't without challenges for Mutsu. At the age of 14, he was diagnosed with pleurisy, an inflammation of the tissues lining the lungs and chest cavity, often resulting in sharp chest pain and shortness of breath. He was advised against heavy physical activities. Understandably, for a teenager, it was difficult to remain idle while his peers were active. Fortunately, after three months of battling the illness, his symptoms began to abate, and Mutsu continued his education. Although Mutsu was well-liked by both his neighbors and peers, it appears that his affable demeanor might have been a facade. According to those who knew him, he was quite pessimistic, and his smile seemed disingenuous. Moreover, while people enjoyed his company, Mutsu never formed any close relationships. Mutsu had a deep affection for his sister, looking up to her as a young brother would. When she got married in 1934, her departure left him feeling abandoned, perhaps because he felt people had a tendency to leave him. Mutsu withdrew from social interactions after his sister moved away. At the age of 17, he became a hikikomori, isolating himself from the outside world. When he turned 20, Mutsu was eager to enlist in the military, a move that would have brought great honor to his family. He excelled in many of the required examinations, falling short only in the health assessment. There, the army doctor discovered that Mutsu had tuberculosis in his lungs, disqualifying him from service. When told the news, Mutsu was devastated. Upon his return to the village, it became clear that the word had spread about his failed enlistment. Mutsuo felt a growing social distance from those around him, a sensation that deepened his sense of rejection. 
He retreated into his home, further isolating himself. During this period, Mutsuo developed an unsettling fascination with a particular crime story. Perhaps you've heard of Sada Abe, a geisha who strangled her lover to death and severed his genitals, keeping them as a grisly memento. This story seemed to captivate Mutsuo. It is said that he even wrote a novel titled Yuto Kayomaru, inspired by the tale. Now, this is where things began to take a darker turn. Japan has a long tradition that might raise eyebrows in other parts of the world. Take, for instance, the oiran who were considered escorts but were also highly educated and talented, catering only to elite clients. In the village itself, there was a peculiar sexual tradition known as yobai, or night crawling. This practice was common in ancient Japan and persisted into the 1900s. An unmarried man would stealthily enter a woman's house at night while she slept and propose intercourse. If the woman consented, the relationship might develop further, sometimes leading to marriage after several such encounters. This tradition has had a lasting influence, even shaping certain aspects of Japanese adult media. So what does this have to do with Mutsuo Toi? Well, he actively participated in yobai. Some say he engaged in these practices frequently, leading to frustration among some women who found him too aggressive. Before the news of his illness spread, many women had consented to his advances, and some had even formed relationships with him. However, as awareness of his incurable disease grew, women began to reject him. One rejection followed another, even from women who had previously been in relationships with him. His feelings of resentment intensified, fueling a dangerously volatile mindset. Mutsu confided his dark intentions to an acquaintance, stating that if his life were to be cut short by tuberculosis, he might as well commit acts even more sinister than those of Sada Abe. These conversations aroused suspicion among his neighbors, leading some to report him to the authorities. The police responded by confiscating his firearms and revoking his gun license. It's unclear how, but even after this, Mutsu managed to retain or acquire a hunting rifle and ammunition. The villagers felt a sense of relief after the authorities seized Mutsu's weapons. They believed he was now powerless and could do nothing more than await his inevitable death. What they didn't know was that Mutsu was meticulously plotting his next moves. In his mind, society had done nothing but mistreat him, and he was preparing to retaliate. A deadly date was drawing near. On May 20th, 1938, it was rainy night in the village, and everyone was settling into their homes to rest and await the next morning. At around 1 a.m., Mutsu cut the transmission cable from the pole, plunging the entire village into a blackout. People hardly noticed. It was late at night, and most were likely sleeping, making them easy targets for Mutsuo's revenge. Afterward, Mutsuo returned home to his attic, where he donned his military gear and strapped a katana and several knives to his waist. He loaded his hunting rifle with live ammunition, preparing as many as 200 rounds. He also took an axe with him and strapped two headlights to his head, as if preparing to go night crawling. Once his preparations were complete, it marked the beginning of Kaiyo's darkest and most heinous night. Mutsu descended the stairs and entered his grandmother's bedroom. The woman who had raised him since he was a two-year-old baby lay soundly asleep. With tears in his eyes, Mutsu raised his axe and decapitated her in a single swing, causing her death to be instantaneous. His grandmother was his first victim, and he planned to claim many more. Stepping outside, he began his killing spree. At that time, many villagers left their doors unlocked, making it easy for Mutsu to gain entry. With his rifle, he slaughtered women, men, and children, those who had once been his partners, regardless of whether they were old, pregnant, or soon to be married. Blood splattered everywhere, and each home he invaded. His victims' ages ranged from 5 to 86. It appeared that he had a list of priority targets. He even went several kilometers to track them down in a single night. 
Once he arrived, both the intended victims and the homeowners would be dead. Towards the end of his rampage, he arrived at the home of Matsuji Takeda, a 66-year-old man. Mutsu let himself in and proceeded to where the family was sleeping. Awakened by the armed intruder, Matsuji initially thought he was about to be robbed and feared for his life and the lives of his family members. However, Mutsu told him not to be afraid and asked him to bring a piece of paper. Matsuji frantically searched but struggled to find the items in his panicked state. Seeing the delay, Mutsu turned to Matsuji's young grandchild and asked for his notebook and pencil. The child complied, and Mutsu tore a page from his notebook. Before departing, Mutsu assured them he wouldn't harm innocent families. He looked at the young boy and encouraged him to study hard and become a great man one day. Then, Mutsu left. Finally, Mutsu ascended to the summit of Mount Senjo. There, he took a moment to pen his last words. Once the note was complete, he knelt and looked at the rising sun. He aimed his rifle at his chest and pulled the trigger. Mutsu Toi was pronounced dead at approximately 5 a.m. on May 21st, 1938. When his body was found along with a note, the authorities revealed Mutsu Toi's motive for committing such a gruesome massacre. First and foremost, he expressed sorrow for his grandmother. He took her life instantly because he did not want her to live with the stigma of being a murderer's grandmother. He also apologized to his dear sister for being a boring, sickly brother. Mutsu stated that he was tired of being treated like an outsider by the people in the village. He felt it was oppressive. Even though his small family claimed to love him, he wept, knowing that their love was mingled with pity. He argued that society should have sympathy for those with infectious and deadly diseases like tuberculosis. He listed the people whom he deemed responsible for shaping him into what he had become. He blamed his past lover, Yuriko Terakawa, for leaving him for another man, although he missed the opportunity to kill her himself. He also blamed his other past partner, Yoshiko Nishida, for rejecting him. He expressed a wish to kill Suichi Terakawa, whom he saw as arrogant. He believed it was easier for Suichi to attract women because he was rich. Butsu also mentioned that if given the chance to be reborn, he wanted to become strong. He aspired to be a strong, healthy individual so that people would no longer look down on him. He was fed up with his unhappy life and wished that the gods would allow him to be a happy man in his next life. The death toll was 31, including Mutsu himself. Shortly after the massacre, Mutsu's sister, whom he loved dearly, also passed away due to tuberculosis. The Kaiyo village was so shaken that it changed its name and the villagers moved away. Today, the village is mostly populated by elderly people who stayed behind when others left. They claim that no one has moved into the village since the massacre. The location is now part of Tsuyama City. A movie based on the Tsuyama massacre was made in 1983 called Doomed Village or The Village of Doom. Directed by Noboru Tanaka, the film includes several dramatized instances. What was the true motive behind Mutsu Otoi's actions? Was it sexual frustration or was it the feeling of oppression he felt from his neighbors? The story of Mutsu Otoi serves as a haunting and sobering lesson in the complexities of human behavior and the detrimental consequences of societal neglect. While we may never fully grasp the various elements that contributed to this horrifying act, it underscores the critical importance of empathy, understanding, and social support systems. Discrimination and stigmatization, whether due to physical illness or societal norms, can have devastating ramifications. As we reflect on this grim chapter in history, let it be a call to action for fostering mental health awareness so that such tragedies may never repeat themselves. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.